Mr. Casey Lau, how are you, man? Um, good to finally meet you. Good to finally see you in person. Read about you for many times. Um, your reputation in the financial world precedes you. Um, and uh, good to finally see you in on in person the first the first time, except on Zoom lah. What's been happening with you, man? <laughs> oh, gl- I'm, I'm glad to be here. And uh, in fact, I, I heard your voice so many times uh, on BFM. So I kind of like fall, uh, fall in love with, with you. I mean, through the radio. <laughs> I finally got to meet you. It's my honor as well. So, um, okay. <clears throat> so, what what are the th- reasons why I was interested with you also is that you have, um, you're someone who hails from Penang. And um, your journey... I have been following your newsletters for some time because I was a subscriber, right? And uh, you're very personal in your newsletters. I like that. And you reveal a lot of your personal life in your newsletters, which is also very nice. I gather that um, you are from humble beginnings. You are from the same hometown as I am, Penang. Uh, Maybe you can tell me a little bit about that. Oh, I I actually didn't grow up uh, in Penang. I, of course, I stayed in Penang for like more than 10 years. I, I moved there, I think, 2001. And I stayed there until, I guess, 2013, before I moved to KL. So before that, I, I grew up in uh, not far away, so, so northern uh, uh, Malaysia, in, in Kedah, Sungai Petani. Okay, and then how did you end up going to Penang? Um, what was the journey there? Oh, like? <laughs> oh so you're like, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm Sungai Petani. Uh, Keta, keta gula, they call, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, in uh, how I moved to Penang is that uh, you know I I uh, I studied in UTM, so th- that's the first time I left my hometown and uh, I went to UTM in Skudai, Johor to study engineering. So I studied uh, aeronautical engineering, and uh, that's where I met my wife. So short story is that uh, we got married after we graduated, and she's working for Intel, and that's how I end up in Penang. Yeah, so some of the newsletters I gathered that um, you you wanted to go overseas, you couldn't. Um, obviously, it's it's a it's a cost issue, right? It's the same thing with any parent today who want to have the best for the children, but maybe cannot afford to, you know, send them to Harvard or or America or the UK. So what did you do? What was your frame of mind at that time? Uh, oh, you know, yeah, yes. Uh, you know, we we have the dream of being able to study the overseas. And in fact, my interest was in music. So I want to study music and uh, you know, some research is, is just that it will cost a lot of money to study music, but uh, it's very hard to make money after you got a music degree or something. So that's maybe not so many uh, good paying jobs. So uh, uh, you know, I communicate with my parents and I understand that uh, they will not be able to uh, fund my education overseas, even if I want to. So uh, of course I want what I wanted to at the time, and uh, I can. I can actually uh, get uh, some scholarships. In fact, my result was uh, pretty good in uh, an SPM during SPM exam. I got like full A's, all ten A's. So uh, I can get scholarship, but the problem is that uh, I didn't get any scholarship that will fund all my living expenses. <laughs> so even that part is challenging for us, right? Even to get the etiquette just to fly to. I have a friend who, who flew to Canada to study. So we're good friends and and uh, I cannot even come up with the etiquette. So that's how I you know, pretty much uh, gave up on the dream to study overseas. So, uh, and the best choice for, for me at that time is I can skip from six if I can get into, if I could get into uh, UTM. So, so I'm, I guess I'm lucky. Like I got the UTM lottery ticket to get, to get there. <laughs> how, how did you feel? Did, was it a... Because I've spoken to a lot of people, right? And uh, some of them, for example, Pang Ziming of EP Plus, um, he talked about how when he was very young, um, from six, from five, right? And he was a brilliant student, okay? But of course, of course, from humble beginnings as well. He's one of the more successful SME millionaires now, okay? And he talked about how it, it really it really impacted his, his mentality. It really shaped his, um, his future, his, his, menta- his way of thinking. Because he thought to himself, wow, this is, you know, this is, this is unfair. Um, and it, it, 
it, it really it, it was such a defining factor in, in the way he does business in the way he conducts his life um, was it a big thing for you? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I agree with uh, what you said. And, and a, a lot of successful people, we know you interview a lot of them. And many of them are coming from humble beginning. And that is what shaped it. And I think it did the same for me. Because, uh, you know, I, I want to be a musician. So I know that I, I'm not going to spend hundreds of thousands to study music. And uh, since I got, got UTM, I can study engineering. So that's my, my, my backup plan. And my parents won't be worried. They know that I can come up with being an engineer, you know. Uh, so I study music on my own. <laughs> so in UTM, in fact, I'm, I'm spending most of my time studying music. So, uh, and before I graduated, I, in fact, I was a full-time musician. You know, I play in piano lounge, in a five-star hotel. And then I also uh, do a music production. During daytime, I arrange music uh, for some local artists. So is it true to say that your passion is music and not financial advice? Or is it both? At that time. At that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we are young, right? You're, you're chasing your dream. You want to be a rock star. You know, this kind of thing. <laughs> but of course, our you know, priority change when you have family. Reality bites. La. So so you see, that's a, <laughs> that, that's the thing. A lot of young people, they ask me, you know, what should I do, right? Should I follow my passion? Because, you know, conventional wisdom is that if you follow your passion, you'll get good at it and then you can make a living from it. Okay? That's the conventional thinking. Of course, the Asian thinking is that if it's music or writing or one of those things, entertainment, forget it. Lah. Sports, forget it. Go ahead and get a predictable job. Engineering, law, medicine, whatever. And then just be pragmatic. Right? Do you regret it? No, I didn't regret. I, in fact, I, I put my effort to chase for the dream, right? Uh, so... Uh, at first, I, I I wrote my songs and then I tried to get a record label to publish it and and since now I'm not famous on yeah, being an artist, so you know that I, I fail on that part. So I couldn't get anybody to publish my stuff. And uh, what I did is uh no I, I did it myself. I DIY. So I, I record all the things. I I wrote all the I arranged all the music. I recorded it in my bedrooms and I I publish it myself. I printed my own CDs and I go sell it. Uh, during the gigs, <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> and you sold how many? I I printed one thousand copies, and I still left with I think hundred or two hundred copies in my house. And every time I move, I have to bring all my unsold CD. So uh, eventually, I think I I just kept like ten copies or something. <laughs> okay, <laughs> la, not too bad, la, But you you didn't you didn't become Jay Z, la, Right. No, of course not. <laughs> far, too far away from there. <laughs> so how did that transition to your, you know, what was the start of what you're doing now? How did that transition begin? Uh, the story is that, uh, you know, when, when I was uh, playing full-time uh, as a pianist in Hyatt Hotel in Johor Bahru at that time, it's called Hyatt Hotel. And uh, one of my mentor, early mentor, he is maybe 24 at that time and and I was poor, I was a poor student I was like uh, maybe 20, 22 21 and and that guy is, is quite successful he owned a ninjutsu dojo you know and he drove a Honda Accord and then later he changed to Audi and uh, he's kind of like oh, a person very successful yeah, to me at that time and so I listened to whatever he said and then he introduced me to a book Call a uh, rich tech poor dad. <laughs> so I say you have to read, read this one. This is damn good. So uh, I think that's that's how I got uh, exposed to you know the world of money. You know, have to you have to look at yourself uh, in terms of uh, personal finance and money, and that's how I I, I kind of uh, have an interest in that too. So uh, eventually, when when I was a full time musician for some times, and at that time when CD sales is dropping. So when the CD sales is dropping, you know, artists, they are not going to have big budget to do CDs anymore because CDs is not selling. So the composer is, is not actually making a lot of money, but uh, artists will, you know, they change their business model. And, and since then, a uh, uh, project for musicians like me uh, is, is just getting less and less. So uh, I have sometimes uh, during daytime, so uh, what I did uh, when I was in Penang, I was still a full-time musician. You know, I, I do gigs at night and I do some production at daytime, but the production is not enough for me. And I, I write songs. I write, uh, I wrote songs uh, every day. Every day I'll try to 
right one, but it's very hard to get it sold to some artists also. So if no sale, no no money, right? And uh, uh, during that time when uh, my university friend, also another mentor of mine, early mentor is called Casey Jong, he recruited me to do financial planning. So since uh, my job are all like at night, so daytime I just <laughs> go and uh, starting sell insurance. Okay, so, so how old were you? How I got started. How old were you then? How old? Yeah. Uh, that time, uh, I think I started 2003. Oh, how old? 2003, okay, 20 years ago, 26. 26. Okay. Mm, 26 so ch children yet or no children? Oh, not yet. Okay, my my so child was born 2007. Okay, so so young enough to take a bit of a risk, um, change like career path and um, things yeah. like that. La. Yeah. What was it like in those days? Yeah, what was it like in those days? You know, renting an apartment, had a bit of money already investments already or, or what was the situation with you and your wife back then oh uh we we are doing okay because my wife is uh, always having a stable job so she doesn't need my money to you know to support her so she can do it on my on her own and and uh since i'm a poor musician so we we we, we are not spendthrift uh, coming from uh you know poor family so both of us are coming from poor family. So we we are basically doing okay. Uh, we are not definitely not uh we are, I, I, I guess say middle class maybe. And and what happened is uh you know I I at the time when I started switching my career to being an insurance agent, my parents actually uh, were very happy. <laughs> so you're <laughs> finally doing a real job. <laughs> Yeah, what did they think about that? Huh? What did they think that you're switching <laughs> paths to, like, say, financial advice? Oh, you, you went to insurance first, right? Yeah, uh, financial planning, but uh, of course, we started from selling insurance. That's the, the fast money we can make from being a financial planner. Okay, okay. So what intrigues me, uh, Casey, about the way you have conducted your business, is that, is that it's, um, it was tailor-made for the work from home and COVID era, way before it's time because all your stuff is online, right? You send newsletters to engage with the customers. You run online courses for your subscribers, I think. You work out a deal on a profit share basis with your experts, uh, whoever they may be, because I'm not a paid subscriber, I don't know. Um, and you do a lot of um, marketing of your profile through YouTube and other social media platforms. Tell me about your business model. Oh, my business model, in fact, is very simple. So it's, it's such a simple business, so I don't have a lot of headache. So uh, uh, how uh, the business model basically is, you know, I I have my uh, products at the back end, and I give away a lot of free stuff. So the free stuff is kind of like marketing, and people get into my funnel. The funnel is very easy. People get in touch through me through emails, and then we build trust from there. And for the people who want to learn faster, they will sign up for my course. And the course are all conducted online. And I structure it the way that we, we can grow the business without uh, more time commitment. So I think I, I like that part about my business where uh, you know my trainer, they, they, they committed for the training. So like uh, I have a, trainer on, on value investing stocks. Uh, you know him, Peter Lim. So he basically teaches on my platform two times a month. So basically that's all, all, he, all his work. And every time he teaches, different thing. So we built on top of what we have done before. And our paid members will get more value and more value as, as long as they stay. So how is that business going in terms of like, say, how many subscribers you've got and uh, how fast do you, do you want to grow this business kind of thing? Oh, I'm, you know, I've, I've come a long way. I first started a blog on 2006 and the business model eventually evolved into like this, I think around 2010. And now it's 2021, so it's quite some time. And uh, in fact, I, I didn't really grow the business too much. Uh, we, we are doing okay. Uh, I have I email subscribers. I have 200 over 1,000 people, paid members. Uh, I think might not 
be over 10,000 over so many years. But uh, since uh, we are running a lifestyle business, I have no office, I have no uh, permanent staff. And it basically allows me to have a lot of uh, personal time, free time, me time, family time. <laughs> so uh, that's how I'm, I'm actually, you know, when you ask this question, is actually I'm actually stuck at this uh, level. I'm, I'm thinking, why well, should I go to the next stage, right? You want to grow, you have to hire more people, you have to grow your team. Um, so with, before we talk about the definition of a lifestyle business, right? Um, what kind of metrics can you share in terms of like, say, how many tutorials do you, um, do you conduct a month? How many products do you have a month? Um, you know, things like that, you know. Uh, I know you can't share revenue or maybe you want to share revenue, it's up to you. Um, but just in terms of those operational metrics. Yep, my, my job scope basically is uh, I have, commitment to do around eight webinars, eight webinars in a month. So about two webinars uh, a week. So one webinar take about one to two hours. And uh, the rest of the time, <clears throat> I'm just uh, making sure the, the operation is running. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Is that how many experts do you have? How many, how many like, you know, seafoods do you have? <laughs> I have... Uh, <laughs> I've partnered with uh, a lot of people before, so I think uh, more than a dozen of them. And eventually we we end up with, now I think I have, uh, I have four uh, very committed trainers that we work uh, on a long-term with for many years, like okay. more than five years already with all these trainers. And 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 their training is, is very, I would say, uh, we do things on evergreen basis. That means their, their stuff is, it won't be outdated after a few years. I think this is the problem most online marketer face because a lot of people, they teach the latest thing, like the latest thing that works. So, you know, internet changes so fast. So the trick you, you teach today won't be valid after three months <laughs> or when too many people are doing that, it's not effective anymore. So they will have to, right? Always come up with new stuff, and uh, but, but not us. So I'm kind of... Uh, uh, I would say fortunate lah. We are in this uh, niche <laughs> talking about personal finance and a lot of the things it, it just keep working whether you say it now or you say it 10 years later. Okay. So so what is the definition of a lifestyle business? <laughs> uh, I'm, I am I didn't realize I'm doing this until you know, this term come out <laughs> called lifestyle business where uh, people say that uh, define that as you you don't work uh, you don't overwork yourself but you make just enough money to sustain the lifestyle you want. So eventually, you know, uh, since we are business owner, I'm operating it as a business. And um, most of the time I put in is in fact to grow the business. So of course, if I don't do anything, we will have money, but uh, I won't see the revenue grow. So every day when I put in effort is in fact actually just to grow it. Okay, so you have, uh, the whole idea is to have some balance between your work and life, right? Um, especially for a lot of people now who are in their 40s and 50s, they see a lot of their peers uh, overworking themselves, getting strokes and high blood pressure. And, and you know, you have to ask yourself, right, is it worth it or not, right? Um, do, you have, do you have any of that in, in terms of your peer circles? Like, wow, this guy has a lot of money, but he's got no time for his children. Or this guy has got, you know, a lot of big career, but wow, he's overweight and all these things. Do you get any of that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. We... we... We have uh, not so many friends uh, that go on different path. And some people, uh, maybe they don't have a, a balanced life. Or they maybe, I don't know, could be the pressure of uh, you know, uh, taking care of a family, and, but you still need to make enough money to go on that. So, uh, well, yeah, when that happened, I, I can, you know, we can tell some stories that uh, some some people really work it very well. I, I have a friend who, who are in sales, uh, doing uh, uh, industrial sales, and, and he's, he's okay. He's making a lot of money, and then he also have he structure his business in a way that he can take care of his family most of the time. Also, his office is, is at home. So I, I, to me, I kind of I, I like it that way because I, I think I was uh, very much uh, affected by the case when you know, when when I was a primary student, uh, there were a few times that I saw my my father 
got injured. He, he was a lumberjack worker. So every time he went to work, he will go to the jungle and he have to stay there in a temporary camp for a few months. And you know, when it is raining season, he'll be at home. So at home, no work, no money. Or he got injured because he's going to uh, in the jungle with the chainsaw. So he got injured a few times and then when he got injured, he was at home. So that's the time when he, uh, you know, my, my mother, and my, my father always, uh, you know, psycho us, I say, you, you, you have to study hard. <laughs> you, you don't want to go into the jungle and work like me. You know, when I got injured, I have to stay at home, no money. And, uh, oh. and, and, uh, and then, you know, his kind of job also, he, he have to be away from his family for a long time. So imagine that uh, when he first saw me, I was born after one month or two already. So I don't want this kind of thing happen to myself, right? And and in fact, my wife is already uh, working full time, and I need all the non office hour uh, to be able to be with my family. And yeah. and I'm I think I'm fashionate to if I can do the lifestyle business, I can you know uh, take my sons to all the tuition, send him to school, and then uh, I've been spending all my time with my my family whenever they are available. Yeah, that's that's fantastic, man. That must have been very tough for you. So Casey, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was um, you decided to move to America. That much was clear from your newsletters, right? Um, I assumed, uh, rightly or wrongly, that you did it for strategic reasons. What was the real reason? Oh, in fact, my reason is very simple. Uh, in fact, I, I, I'm fortunate again. My wife got a job offer from a... a uh, you know, one of the Fortune 500 company in the US, and we, and she got a job offer to move there, move our whole family over there, and I just make it easy for her, since I my business is remote, I can it's a lifestyle business, I can run it from anywhere, so uh, I say well, why not if you got the offer, then we should go just to experience uh we got got paid to experience the other part of the world so. Uh, no resistance at all. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, if you're talking about strategically, no, it's, it's, it's in fact, uh, uh, you know, accounting wise and taxes wise, uh, it's not actually good for my business to move to America, in fact. Oh, yeah, because you got to think about paying taxes in America where you're domiciled, right? And of yes, course, if you earn yes. ringgit, you uh, subsist in US dollar. That's obviously that's the yes, wrong I'm, direction. Yeah. Right? You, you're like making well, making ringgit and then you are spending US dollar, right? Everything is uh, four times more expensive there. Everything. Was there, were there advantages yeah. to doing that? Like, for example, in America, there's so many financial experts, right? There's so many financial advisors. Mm. They could have become your experts on your platform. And then you could also open up the business to American customers. Did you t- did you tap any of that? No, I, I in fact, I, I didn't actually do that because uh, uh, in America, they are not lack of all these financial experts, they have many of them there. And my customers, in fact, they are all Malaysians. So if I go there, if, if I want to do business there, I have to do the business of the Americans. So there are already many people who are successful in doing my niche <laughs> over yeah, there. So I have to yeah. compete with them. And I'm not, I don't speak their language. They speak American, right? I yeah. don't have the, the culture is different. Which part so of America? It's not as easy as we think. Where where in America did you go? Uh, do you know Oregon, Portland? Not really. Is that up north? Uh, up? Yeah, north is northwest. So north, uh, north, you know south. California, right? So yeah. California, the northern California will be uh, San Francisco. So yeah. from San Francisco, you go up, it will be Portland. And then after Portland will be Seattle. And then after Seattle will be Vancouver. Oh, that Canada. would have been a beautiful part of the world, man. Oh, it's very beautiful. So I'm... You know, what I did there over there when I stay there is that uh, I, I go for a hike every week. Wow. A long hike will be every week, like uh, at least eight miles and above. So wow, I'll explore no all the trails. And and I've been doing hiking a lot during my two years and a half stay there. And uh, I try to go every week. And, and that, that's, that's the day that got me excited, you know. <laughs> I <try laughs> to uh, go to see waterfall, go to see the beaches, uh, go to see... Uh, whatever, the Soul Mountain, so. <laughs> yeah, that's that's amazing. But then, um, 
what were the challenges also in terms of um, like maybe getting no new customers or, or you know or did it just allow the business to just like run on its own and have the other side of your of your life it, um, you know move on like your your life side right your health your peace of mind your mental health all that was was um, was seeing some progress more progress on the work side <laughs> in, in fact uh, you know I wherever I stay right I, I I, in fact, just doing what I, I love to do. So it's, it's still doing the same thing. So I, I still go to watch movie in the cinema. Of course, that's before COVID. But last time I, I watched it in Malaysia and I do it during the cinema day where they have discount, right? I think Wednesday or something. And then I, I, I went there like 11 a.m. watching the first show. <laughs> but in, in America, I'm still doing the same thing. They also have the cinema day. Or other. I think it's... I think it's Tuesday or something, I forgot. And then <laughs> I also watched the first show because it's the cheapest, right? <laughs> Still doing the same thing. <laughs> it's just doing it, uh, paying different money and uh, doing it uh, at a different place. So I'm still running a business. It's just the time zone that is different. So all my webinar, I used to do it in, in the morning, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. But there I'll have to do it uh, at night, <laughs> 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock. <laughs> 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 but yeah. then you didn't stay in America. How long were you there for? Because I understand now you moved to another part of the world. Yes, I, I just moved to Taipei, in fact, uh, just out of quarantine. So it's, it's, less, it's less than a, a month here. I yeah. think this is the third week. And wow. uh, uh, why, why did I move again, right? So the reason is still very simple. It's just that my wife got another job offer. She got a raise, got a promotion, and working for even a better company that is growing. So it's a no-brainer for her to switch career. And I also make it easy for her. <laughs> I say, okay, of course, you want to go to Taipei. Well, why not? I, I like Taipei too, because we, we, our whole family, we, we love Taipei. We have been here for many times for, as a tourist. Oh, okay. But they've never stayed for long to experience the, the culture here, right? So it's, it's like America. When we, we went there a few times, uh, you, if you don't stay there for a long time, you don't really know the things over there. What did you learn? Okay, let's just talk about America for a while, right? America is what? What did you learn about from America? What were the good things and the bad things? You know, because obviously America now losing power to China and all that kind of thing, right? Um, and then there's a lot of big, there's a big wealth divide, right? The, between the rich and the not so rich, how homeless and people on food, food uh, kitchen. What What were your impressions like? I I think on. About the, these macro issues, uh, I, I won't talk more about that. You can always read our experts talking about that. Let's talk about the micro issue that's like yeah. people, a person like your living there. Like, like, yeah. the Malaysians, yeah, Malaysians yeah. living there. So how is it like, right? We, the labor cost there is very expensive. The labor cost is expensive because uh, you have to pay a lot of taxes. Even you earn $2,000 a month, you still pay taxes, right? So there are a lot of taxes and they have they have federal tax, they have state tax, the state also tax you. And then you have to pay your social security, you have to pay the Medicare and the medical cost is very expensive. That makes hiring very expensive. So, so this basically inflate everything. So whenever money change hands, uh, there's tax money involved. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we live in a big house. So the house is spacious, we like it. Oh, the yeah, problem with something break, when something break, first thing I do is YouTube. You never call somebody. <laughs> Fix like, yourself. Not in Malaysia, yeah. Like Malaysia. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Malaysia, you will you will call somebody, right? And and like uh, medical issues, if you if you're sick or something, uh, you will go over the counter and buy some like things like Panadol, but you you don't go visit doctor straight away. So it's you you we get different thing. Yeah. Did you, because um, one of your newsletters was, um, right, should, <laughs> should I sell my house? Should I rent it out? Well, did you reach a decision <laughs> yeah. on that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I also uh, told my reader about that. I wrote a book, blog post about that. We, I, we still keep the house. We still keep the house because the... The, the rental, rental, la, the rental yield. Not yield bad. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's 4.4% 4. 4. Uh, rental yield. So it's enough to cover the interest. That's so not too bad. Yeah, just having our bad. tenants to pay off the house for us. Then, did you make? Did you do you advise people who want to move to America? Is it is that still a dis good decision? Like as it was before. Remember in the seventies and eighties, a lot of people used to go yes. to America, even through yeah. the nineties. 
Is is it such you a good idea anymore? You go to Sai Tai Beng, ah, we went to New York to do in the That's right. kitchen helper. That's it's, right. No, no, I, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a good idea though. Uh, uh, unless you are, you are making good money in in the US. If you are making I think less than hundred thousand, I don't think it is good life for you. It's a tough life, is it? Because costs are very high. Yeah, hundred thousand US dollar is is a lot of money in, in Malaysia term, but there I think is. No, hundred thousand for a whole family is is not much. It's tough. Huh? So, so uh, but uh, we we have a lot of Malaysians friend there. So some of them uh, actually graduated in university there, and then they, they started working for the corporate over there, and then you know as a knowledge worker, life is pretty good for them. I would say okay, if you go that path, because they're mm -hmm. quite senior already, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So so Taiwan is interesting because Taiwan Taiwan is an is in, is in Asia. It's uh okay, but for the problems with China. Taiwan is a very, very technologically advanced country. Some of the companies there are amazing, right? And for Malaysians as well, there's a lot of Malaysians there, I understand, and the stock market there is also very vibrant. Um, what are you learning about Taipei three weeks into the, well, a month, about a month into the country? Uh, I think it will, it, will, it will be a totally opposite from what I we experienced in the US. Oh. So here, the, yeah, uh, here will be the convenience the convenience uh, scoring, I would say, right, is 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 the top. It's it's really convenient. You've got everything. Just walking within like hundred meters, you've got all the things you need. Basically, you you don't have to leave, and it's even more convenient than KL area, right? It's, it's, and we, uh, I think this this is the part I I noticed first, <laughs> since I'm 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 still new here. I I cannot stay a lot of. of no. So so you're living you're living in the city center, right? So everything's within reach. Um, laundry mats, uh, convenience stores, supermarket, banks, and all that, right? What about the cost of living? Cost of living, I think the the biggest one will be housing. Housing, uh, but do you have to buy or do you, would, actually, you would you would you advocate we, renting? We will instead? be renting. We will be renting here. We will be renting. We will not be buying because uh, the the house is is quite expensive, like the. If, if you are looking for a condo like with that with uh, three bedrooms, right? It will be, it will be about five six million US uh, Malaysian ringgit. Sorry, Holy five six moly, million Malaysian right. ringgit. Okay. Yes. Okay. So uh, and so if you renting that house, we are probably paying uh, about ten thousand ringgit a month. But if you want to buy it, you probably pay uh fifteen thousand to twenty thousand a month. So we still prefer to rent it at. Uh, at this point of time. And then what about further out? If you wanted to say, for example, retire in Taiwan, right? Um, maybe, get, maybe get a PR or something, spend some months of the year there, would it make sense? Oh, yes, yes. In fact, in fact, yes, I'm looking at, at that uh, <laughs> possibility. Okay. Because of the, they have the national health uh, insurance or something, they call it uh, Bao. So uh, it's totally opposite from what we have in, in the US. Because US, really the medical cost will make you bankrupt. If you don't have insurance, wow. So, okay. uh, uh, and and you can only buy the medical care, Medicare insurance like uh, starting age sixty five or something. So people have to work until sixty five to retire to get Medicare, right? If not, if you're on your own, you don't have insurance, or you have to pay like ten of thousand every year for insurance. So, but but in in Taipei, it's, I think it's pretty good, and and even if you pay for the medical cost yourself, uh, you. It is kind of like it's, it's not expensive though. What, what, what kind of ballpark figures are we talking about in, in Taiwan? Uh, if you are walking into clinic, it's something like Malaysia. Could be cheaper too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's quite it's quite cheap medically speaking. Now. But what about like rentals and like, yeah. you know, um, essential items and stuff like that? Uh, uh, no, all the other stuff, uh, no, it's, it's not expensive. In not fact, expensive it's, it's quite very affordable. It's quite affordable. And then culturally say. speaking, for someone like you who's Chinese can speak Mandarin, is it much obviously much easier than <laughs> Malaysia la, uh, than America? Yeah, right? obviously it's much easier because all the banking system they all use uh, Chinese, right? So even us, uh, we we study Chinese uh, from in Malaysia, we, we still have to get used to the terms here. But but you get used to it; it's, it's not hard. And uh, mm, so far, I think what we enjoy is is the food. 
it's, really, it's good, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, food. Uh, and then, uh, and then since uh, Taiwan is a small country, so you get to see a lot of things as well. And you have the, the weather is not so extreme. You got uh, some uh, cooler winter, yeah, but not like freezing cool. Isn't um, isn't like <laughs> Taiwan like um, prone to hurricanes and earthquakes and stuff like that? Oh, oh yes, yes. In fact, yes. <laughs> That's the I other haven't thing, experienced right? that part, right? Uh, <laughs> I haven't experienced that part, so I cannot say much about that. But we did experience earthquake uh, during our tourist day. So yeah. even in a short stay, like 10 days, we still experience earthquake. So I think this is pretty common here. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's talk about investments, right? Um, do you mm. do, do well, obviously you must do investments. What are your investments? Yes. What, what is your head headspace around that? We, uh, I mainly invest in two, two asset class. So the first is properties and the second will be businesses. So businesses, uh, you can, it, it is my own business is other people's business like stocks. Basically you buy stocks, you're buying other people's business. So just these two. Okay. So properties, is what, what is your thinking there? Um, obviously in Malaysia, um, mm -hmm. you know, America, you've got your house. Um, mm -hmm. so, so yeah. what are your principles around that? Uh, properties make it a very profitable profitable investment is because of the leverage so when you're young if you have uh, earning capability you can get financing and the financing is is cheap for properties so uh, i think i think the financing part play a very very big difference for property investment because uh, essentially you're not using your money so you're you're having a leverage effect and the leverage effect is is not it's not as dangerous as margin financing, like when you trade stock we're using margin, yeah. right? Because margin, they, they check on your margin uh, daily or even hourly or even every minute real time. So whenever your assets depreciate a lot due to the price changes, they will call you to top up your account, right? Or they will for sell your, your shares. But, mm -hmm. but in properties, it's just one commitment. You just have to pay the installment, right? <laughs> so as long as you pay, nobody's going to bother you. <laughs> Does the lack of liquidity in real estate bother you? Um, no, no. Not really. So, so you're that's just why, holding I, on that's to why I like, yeah, that's why I like the combination of stocks and property. So stocks is, is liquid. So yeah. whenever you, you want money, you can actually take margin money, uh, uh, financing out of it. You don't even have to sell your stocks. Dare I ask right. how many properties you've got? We have got, uh, I think I have eight in Malaysia and one in US. Okay, okay. Then yeah. Um, yeah, you do... A handful, la, not many. No. Handful. Uh, the industrials or um, warehouses have, or, or residentials? We have four, four, shop, four shop houses in, in Malaysia. One factory, small one. And some residential, like two apartments and one landed semi D. Okay. Okay. So that yeah. that's obviously that that's going to give you a nice um nest egg when you eventually decide to dispose of them, right? Because they're like yes. little little snowballs all rolling down the hill, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. And then do you have a weightage between real estate and equities um or private businesses? Do you have do, is it like a fifty fifty thing for you or is it like thirty seventy? So so what's when, your space there? Yeah. When when we. I will, I will suggest that when you're young, when you can get uh, financing for very long term, like 30 years, 35 years, I think uh, you should start with properties because it gives you the very big leverage effect. So acquire it when, when you're young. And when you're getting older, like me, 40 somethings, I, I, I don't really prefer properties anymore because we, you know, our financing could be 20, 25 years. So our installment uh, will be higher. So the commitment will be higher. And, uh, and stocks is it has another advantage over properties is that if you are getting a good business, there's no limit of the growth. Of course, it's, there's a limit, right? The population is limited. But yeah. but when a business you buy it at like say hundred million, if it grows so big until like hundred billion, so it's like so many folds, right? But you don't have to do anything. It's like hands off, and you can sell it anytime, or you can borrow money with it anytime. Yeah, but properties the longer you keep it, uh, the older it gets, and of course you have to pay maintenance as well. So there are pro and con. So uh, I I I have the two combination of of these two type of assets to just to complement each other. 
So just to clarify, when you say 100 million, you're not going to spend 100 million. You're, you're, you're buying into a company which is worth 100 million by market cap. <laughs> yeah, so people <laughs> yes, might think, well, yes, can you see now 100 million? Um, <laughs> so do you do Malaysian no, stocks not. or do you do American stocks or do you do Taiwanese stocks? What, what's your thinking there? Local, foreign, um, global? Most of uh, most of our stock holdings is in the US now. So uh, last time in Malaysia, it's, it's quite hard for you to own overseas stocks. But now it, it's pretty much very easy. So, so you, a you lot got of brokers also. They, you dispose a lot of your Malaysian stocks and bought more American stocks? Uh, no, actually, we still have some you know, Malaysian stocks as well. Yeah. So uh, what's your thinking there? Put it in stocks. Yeah. So what's your thinking there? Do you buy tech? Do you <laughs> buy, you know, conglos? What, what do you buy? What's your th- thinking there? Uh, no, we, we, we don't prefer any specific uh, industry. But what I like is uh, I, I like business that has a proven business model that is making profit already, at least for like five years. And then uh, we don't pay uh, excessively high price for that. So uh, you no, know, just keep it for long term. I think long term is very important. So whenever yeah. talking about investing in stocks or properties, always have to think of like when you buy that, when, when I buy the stocks, I'm, I'm thinking of keeping it at least for four or five years. So what is your thinking about retirement, right? Because you've got a lot of assets now that are ready to be sold or disposed at any time, right? At what point mm-hmm. in time do you stop becoming frugal or stop being frugal and start to spend on yourself? Because some people can never do that, right? They will always, mm-hmm. like I know some billionaire glove uh, owners, right? Yeah. And they are still so fringe, um, frugal with themselves. They still, <laughs> yeah, they're still so frugal with themselves, but they're worth a few billion. They don't want to change their car. They don't want to wear nice suits. Um, and then they just want to hoard the cash. That obviously is not optimal as well, right? Well, well, what's your I, thinking I there? Think, well, I think every people are different. Uh, every person are different. They have their own preference of things and they know what makes them happy. So I guess uh, there are a lot of... Uh, very wealthy people and they are still full gold. It's not that because they don't like to spend the money. It's just that uh, spending the money doesn't make them happy, right? So like you say, the, of the glove, uh, some of the glove billionaire in Malaysia, I guess they, they like to see their business grow. And that's their focus. I think that make them happier than driving a Ferrari or flying a private jet, right? It's just like Buffett, no? Buffett is someone I really, really like, you know, uh, I treat him like God, right? <laughs> in, in my, I mean, his, his status is like that because he's, he's so wise and he knows what makes him happy and, and, and whatever wealth he created for his shareholders and himself is basically he's created and he, he won't be using it, right? He's going to give it away. So he knows uh, he's going to ha- be happy eating McDonald's, drinking Coke, driving uh, old Cadillac. Uh, that's what makes him happy. So I, 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 in fact, I, I try that when you talk about retirement, right? Uh, when I got to America, uh, how a uh, car is very cheap because we already paid all the taxes in our, from our I saw your Corvette. Was <laughs> that the Corvette that you bought? Some, some convertible it's not Mustang. A you bought a Mustang. It, it's a Mustang. Yeah, it's a Mustang. Yeah, so Corvette yeah. is twice the price of a Mustang. So if I'm staying in America, probably uh, if I sell, when I sell off uh, my Mustang, I'll probably go to you know, a Camaro or a Corvette. But those things are not expensive there. And, and I'm, I, I, during the time I was thinking, you know, if, if I get a Porsche or Ferrari or what, it's, it's still not very expensive there. Right? We can definitely afford it. But uh, I don't see me you know, being happy <laughs> spending that money, you know. Uh, it will not make me happy. So, in fact, I, I, I think I, I use the word fortunate again because I realized what made me happy, right? I, when I play a song, I compose and I listen to it, I record, I, that makes me happier than driving a Ferrari. <laughs> and that doesn't cost a lot of money, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Watching a good movie, uh, watching a good movie, even on a laptop or on a phone, it feels better than watching a lousy movie in the theater on your own, right? Right. So, yeah. so, so that's my thinking. So, I guess, uh, I guess, most people just have to like uh, find the things that is happy for them. So, for me, uh, retirement. Uh, yes, in fact, we we are actually we can afford to retire. We can not work, right? Uh, we will have enough money to spend frugally for the rest of our life. Our life, but uh, you know, life is short. Go and 
chase whatever you want, <laughs> do it while you can. Yeah. As my so, mentor. what is your advice about retirement? What should you? What is your advice to people about this 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 idea of retirement? <laughs> Interesting question. So, uh, I'll bring up the word fortunate again. So, uh, I I'm I think you have to work on a career that you you enjoy doing. So, uh, and and sometimes the happiness is is not coming from the money. Of course, the money it is a measurement, and when it comes, it make you happy as well. And and the effect of your work is also very happy. And I guess uh, some people just cannot find the the exact meaning of their work. So uh, a lot of work is actually very very meaningful. Uh, it has a lot of impact on on people's life. So uh, if if you don't find joy in your work, I guess uh, you have to just keep changing your career and and find one that is that you really enjoy doing and have meaning to you. And when you're talking about retirement, uh, even when you retire, you have to do something. So it's not like uh, I I don't buy the idea that saying oh you you earn a lot of money and when it is enough. You, you work like a dog and when it's enough, you stop and then you start to enjoy life. I, I don't see that uh, as a, a appropriate goals uh, to work on. Because uh, once you stop working, if you don't really know what you, you like in your life, what, what makes you happy in your life, you probably get lost at that time. What is your advice about parenting? Um, do you leave your children the money? Um, do you or do you do you ensure that they stay hungry? What is your idea about uh, parenting? Well, this this is really hard questions, right? And <laughs> traditional Chinese and we, is like tra- traditional Asian is like you leave them, <laughs> you you take care of them and you sort them out, right? And then hopefully your money will yeah. stay to the next generation and the next generation after that, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I guess we. Uh, you know, we, we, we cannot we cannot have practice on parenting. I think this one you agree with me. We, it's like when they're one year old, you should do this. When they're two years old, you should do this. Three years old, you should do this. But we cannot like practice the first round and you do it. And the more you do it, the better you get, right? So so to me, like parenting is one time thing. So uh, and and my thinking is that uh, we if, if we can prepare our, our children to be more successful uh, than us, then I think you are doing a good job. So, uh, of course, we we are doing much better than our parents, and our children are, are having a good base to start. So I guess we have to think longer term, like how am my son is going to be more successful than me? So what does he need right now? So I think this is a question we should ponder and and see what uh, we should prepare for 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 them. Yeah. And what about Mm -hmm. um, advice to people in these times? It's very volatile, very uncertain. Everybody is, there's a lot of um, anxiety out there, right? Um, The world is changing. America seems to be declining. China seems to be coming up. Um, There's this virus that won't go away. People are dying. Um, Business is uncertain. There's lockdowns all over the world. Um, We don't know whether the vaccine is going to work, if at all. What is your advice about that? How to deal with uncertain times? <laughs> oh, this is a very tough question. So I'm I'm not an economist or anyone. Personal, right? That how how are you dealing deal. with it? So uh yeah, personally I will say uh enjoy the moment. You have to like live the moment as if it is the last time you are living this. So uh like for example, this this thing hit me. Uh, I have we have a good friend who suddenly died not not from COVID, but he suddenly died uh, you know, due to some other thing. I we, we actually don't know the cause. And what the last time I saw how, him, how, how old was he? He was uh, I think two just two years uh, old or three years older than me. So we are the uni friend, and we met every year uh, when uh, during Chinese New Year we'll we'll meet right. For gathering so probably several times a year and the last time i met him was uh 2019 when i went back to malaysia for vacation that, that time i was, I was uh, residing in the us so that was the last time i met him 
and 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 some of my uh, friends also say that you know that that was the last time or when was the last time they met somebody so uh, you also make me think right uh, that's that's one of the main reason also my my wife actually uh, you know, apply for a job in Taiwan because because it's so close to home and our parents are old and we try to say oh do, do you want to come to America to visit us but uh, none of them is willing to go there <laughs> yeah it's too far so right? even yeah. even we, we bought a big house or we, bought, we have good cars now uh, to take them around if you come I can you know, show you around but uh, no because they, they don't the language is not their thing they don't speak English so uh you know, these, these are the things that we cannot give them. And, and that's why it's making these things also. We moved also to the family. And uh, oh, when you're talking about Taiwan, do you want to come? So uh, these are the big changes uh, we made in our lives too, even though during COVID and, and we move. Yeah, Taiwan is amazing. Taiwan is only three hours away. And I even I understand yeah. parts of the country speak Hokkien, right? Which is what we speak in Taiwan <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the food yeah, is yeah. good. The weather is nice, but for the earthquake. So... Um, it was a real pleasure <laughs> chatting with you, like Casey. It, it was a good, it was a good conversation. I think we had. So um, thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. Good luck, man. Hope to see you back in uh, Malaysia soon. <laughs>